भाइयों और बहनों राष्ट्रपति जी ने आपातकाल की घोषणा की है इससे आतंकित होने का कोई कारण नहीं है द प्रेसिडेंट हैज प्रोक्लेम्ड इमरजेंसी दिस इज नथिंग टू पैनिक few people had created a situation of um, indiscipline which was leading towards grave problems of law and order and uh, had they continued i think we would have had anarchy in this country now in new york times unfortunately excuse me continue please i was saying unfortunately these movements which have started quite some time ago Uh, they declared a plan of action on the 25th uh, of uh, June uh, which uh, would have aggravated the situation nobody knew that the emergency had been declared it had been officially signed by indira gandhi at about 1 o'clock that night and they picked me up at 4 o'clock 3 hours after that they came and picked me up and i remember this terrible banging on my front door shall i go into the details Absolutely. there was a terrible banging on my front door and i went and opened it really irritated who's you know knocking on my door at 3:30 4 in the morning and making such a racket and i got a shock when i opened the door there were about 10 policemen ha huh? bandook ke sath ha huh? he said this is your warrant so i said warrant of what i haven't lost anything he said no this is the warrant of your arrest and i swear i couldn't make head or tail of what this paper was saying e i was still half asleep ha huh? but there was a lawyer friend who lived opposite my flat sunny lal so i went in rang his doorbell rang his doorbell rang his doorbell till he came out very irritated yeah i said sunny this is a warrant of my arrest just read it and tell me do i have to go with them so he looked at it and then he started shaking <laughs> he said shila ta you will have to go with him this is a warrant under misa um huh? i said what's misa he says maintenance of internal security act and it's a very it's a black law you know you have to go with them so then my officer took my papers and he said stay here i was sitting in the car watching this tamasha going huh and then he came back after about 15 minutes and he, he told the driver tihar and they drove me straight to tihar when the emergency was declared and that's also very interesting the day emergency was declared was the last day of the shooting of my fil- my father's film chandamaruta which was a prediction of the things to come in which my mother acted as well my parents were socialists but uh, 
I think they were not dogmatic socialists. My mother and my father both very passionately believed in this. You know, justice was justice and, you know, rights were something that was sacrosanct. So she was very close to Madhu Leme and George Fernandez used to visit our house. He was a young man at that time. He was a fiery trade unionist. And George had evaded arrest on the night of the emergency, that is on the 25th of June. Uh, but he, and we knew he was in the underground somewhere. And uh, he came to Bangalore, I think, two or three months after. And when he came, CGK Reddy, we had organized a meeting between him and CGK, who was with the Hindu at that time. CGK was really the brains, the, the strategist behind the underground movement. And my mother and father both were very much a part of it. I mean, contacting people, developing, uh, producing literature, writing things about that needed to be, you know, distributed. And then later, three months later, emergency was uh, set. And uh, uh, George Fernandez came to the same room and they, my mother and father hit him in the same room. You know, so it was like, uh, first there was film, but then real life repeated film. Because the same house was used for the film. And we had people like mock policemen looking into the house, looking for the boy. Same thing happened when George was there. He was hiding, the police were being around, and we had to be quiet, and he was dressed in... Yeah, George Fernandez was dressed in some... He was dressed as a Sikh, a tennis-playing Sikh. See, actually, and he also was propagating something which uh, actually my mother didn't believe in and I didn't believe in. So he's advocating burning uh, letter boxes. But ba basically because we knew him so well, like because of Lohia and all that, we were like sweet and looked after him. And I remember that there was a very, very long discussion. My mother heated, almost heated argument with George about selective sabotage. And she was totally against violence. And that was the time I wanted to join the underground movement. So I had been sent out of the house in which George was hiding. And I was sitting on the, on the, you know, the uh, compound ball, but I could hear through the window what they were saying. And finally, George uh, agreed that there would be no harm to any human being or any living thing. One of the strategies was to throw letter bombs into letter boxes. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was concerned that this should be done only after the clearance time. So letters that people had actually written to people wouldn't be harmed. You know, I mean, she was you know, concerned to that level. So the DMK was in power at that time, and it was anti-Congress at that time. They supported the Congress some other times, but at that time they were anti-Congress. So people uh, kind of uh, moved towards Chennai to have meetings, and uh, so that became a hub. CJK uncle gave us the rules for underground work. You know, how to do it and how not to tell people. And uh, so, all of us didn't know all the information. All my group people didn't know where the cyclostyling machine was. Some didn't, many didn't know where George was. So all those things were quite, uh, you know, followed strictly. But they themselves didn't follow sometimes, you know, <laughs> CJK and George, because they would go and tell everybody uh, about this and that. Sneha talked about it and said, why don't you take George to Chennai and all that. Through Sneha and actually I became more politicized rather than my a father. My mother was still very much an artist and an actor and a, and a theatre person and a singer and a dancer. And she was very vibrant, very affectionate, very eloquent. Uh, she was a born actress in some ways. Uh, she... It was something that was instinctive and inherent in her. And she would actually become that character. 
And my mother always questioned. She questioned the authority all the time. Like she saw policemen beating up children on the street, she would stop. She would fight with them. You know, she, uh, she uh, did not have that hesitant. She should just jump into the fire whenever she had. And she was very loving. She was, I mean, her, our house was always open and tea was served and people used to just come and talk to her and tell her, tell her, her their love stories or their problems and this. She started uh, theatre companies, Madras players, and she came inside Abhina and Bangalore. So, um, fearless soul. So, <laughs> so you must miss her a lot. Uh, yeah, totally. Sneha. Patabi Patabi, Nandana, Kunara, and J. Power. Nan yarin zul mukhadik sirlela. Ik kali taide. Also, to put her in context of Karnataka politics, for example, uh, what Samskara did, you know, uh, in the sense she acted in it, but also what Samskara did for Kannada new wave cinema. You know, there's a whole feeling of pride that we had act they had actually come up with something, you know, made an intervention which was both aesthetic and uh, political, and uh, profoundly political. I mean, it was banned. The film was banned when it was released. Let's say she was embedded in that political space also, which was um, liberal, anti-caste, uh, you know, speaking for a kind of modernist, modernist literary movement. In a sense, what was happening in that home while those debates, discussions, etc., were getting processed, moving out into public space through journalists, you know, uh, and she was very central to all that. So, uh, while I say her politics was humanist, the fact is, the way she was read, uh, you know, at, at least in Karnataka, uh, whether it was J.H. Patel, or all these guys, you know, uh, all these doyaites slash socialists, was very much a part of their movement. She was one of them. It's very hard to explain the, that entire period of emergency in the sense of um, 
See, if you weren't in touch, as a middle class person, if you weren't in touch with somebody who was affected, it was very hard to know emergency existed. For people like us, it was like you knew the house was being watched, right? You were living with constant surveillance. You couldn't trust anybody, right? And we were doing things like couriers, moving materials, burning them when we got news that there might be a raid and all that. So it, it was all, as I said, it was kind of surreal. How do I explain that time and that feeling and that, uh, uh, you know, that kind of tension all the time? Because the state is irrational, it's arbitrary, it's violent, extremely violent. Um, and uh, you you feel kind of powerless, you know. So there were meetings, you go to places, you talk, um, there are ways that these certain actions are being organized, etc. But the general mood was one of despair. Profound, profound, bleak despair. So I just want you to just go back first to the circumstances of the arrest. I think first night, I think I was alone at home. And these guys came and picked me up. And they also picked up Lawrence from uh, George's mother's house, his brother. And they took us to some COD office. And I was quite sensible that I was not really too aggressive with them. But I think Lawrence started getting upset. So they started, they met him up and so he was... Uh, he was hurt and stuff like that, but I, didn't, I could hear him, I couldn't see him. And then they put me in, a, in I think, high grounds police station, that lock-up. But the trouble was nobody was at home, they didn't know, they came, in, came into the house with my mother, father and sister and went to Madras. So after that, for three days, they, was, they went to Madras looking for them. And finally, uh, I think, they went for a wedding or something, so they uh, arrested them, or picked them up. And my mother said, you'd leave... Uh, rest of the family, the only person you need to arrest is me. This is who? That's where my father's signature. Certified that this is the diary of my wife. By the time Adwani and all of them were in jail, you know, in, in, in central jail. Emma Sapara was in jail. I mean, all of them. Uh, Ramkrishna Hegde, J.H. Patel, S. Venkatram, uh, you know, all of the whole, whole lot were there. But your mother was the only woman. She was the only woman and she was isolated in the, in the female section. And it was the, uh, it's almost like solitary confinement for her. Because she had no communication with anything. First, she was under DIR. Um, and that is Defense of India Regulations. And when she was released under the IR, at the moment they were released, they were rearrested under MISA. 
So they they were doing that even then. Just they were doing releasing that. you and immediately arresting you, re-arresting you, and because there were no charges filed against any of them, and they were not part of the Baroda Dynamite case either. So then, when she was put in jail, uh, and Misa, then we were allowed to visit her only once a week, and sometimes even those visits were cancelled. She was a chronic asthma, asthma patient. But it was not just the asthma. They, they put her on high doses of cortisone in the jail to try and contain it. And that affected her heart. And also she was giving herself adrenaline. And she was injecting herself in the thigh. And in that desperation, one doesn't know what, you know, she was actually doing. So she had said, she went into asthmatic coma several times. She made several petitions that you know, to at least be able to visit the men for half a day. And they said, no, 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 we can't. It's for your own protection that we can't allow you to meet the men. As the months went on, you could see that when we met her, she was, she was you know, frantic, almost frantic. And uh, she also started accusing us of not doing enough because she felt we could actually do something and we were not doing it. Like, why didn't you go and see Malaya? How can you say that he was charming? How can you say that he's, you know, you talk as though you like him? You know, so that kind of syndrome also. And, you know, accusing my father of not doing enough. What about parole? Why don't you do it? I think that was the hardest thing to watch because I would visit her regularly and um, to see that decline and, and, and to see that despair and um, I mean I used to keep thinking that there's a way in which you know even in the women's prison these kind of the way the warders you know this, this, these petty tyrannies these kind of hierarchies playing women against each other and their natures change you know because they are constant. That's what Sneha used to keep saying. And she says, it's so terrible because you, there's these terrible fights and arguments and you, you know it's because of those conditions. Women were stripped naked and uh and searched. I mean, I remember women were complaining that, you know, they didn't have any sanitary napkins. I remember my mother fighting for that and saying that they should at least have hot water on those days. I remember once we took some flowers to my mother and the women tended those flowers for so long, so carefully, you know, changing the water, etc. It actually lasted, you know, two weeks because they'd never seen flowers once they had gone into jail. And see what happened at that time, she didn't want me to be in, uh, in India. So I got to the, a, a seat in a music college in America. So when I went there, she promised me that I should go. So I left when she was in, in jail. She writes about that in the... She writes about that, yeah. I've read the... You read the prison diary, yeah. yeah. I don't think she managed to see you before you went. I, I went to the prison to say bye.
Achave, Achave. And uh, you're making some attempts to try and find out whether she's going to come out. Or, I mean, you must have tried the legal. We were doing everything. I mean, my father made these several applications for parole. And he would run around and banks would refuse because they didn't want to have anything to do with, you know, any political prisoners. And it was the emergency was still very much in place. So uh, nationalized banks didn't want to touch it. And uh, the, then uh, banks, there were a couple of banks because of some connections my father had, finally agreed that they would give the bank guarantee, which was a huge amount. It was about five lakhs that they had uh, set. You know, there was this whole desperate thing to put the money together and the bank would actually agree finally and then the parole would be refused. And this would be repeated again and again. I mean, this happened, I think, several times during the last, during the time, the eight months that she was in jail. She would have taken to the RMO's office. So she would use the RMO's phone and call the house. And the RMO, after examination, etc., would recommend her case for admission. And all the paperwork, you know, would be done. And then he'd get a, he'd have to call the Home Secretary to tell him. And then uh, he would tell him, I'm admitting her for treatment. And 10 minutes later or five minutes later, the Home Secretary would call back and say, no, you can't admit. Except suddenly one day, you know, uh, in, uh, you know, December, they just released her. They said, come and collect her, come and pick her up. And uh, so we went and picked her up and we couldn't understand why. And that was probably because uh, in, in hindsight and reading her diary and, you know, later, you know, talking to her personal doctor who, who was attending on her before she went to jail, that is Dr. Pai, that she had probably had several heart attacks in jail. And her, her condition had deteriorated to such an extent that they were scared that she might die in jail and then it would be on their heads. I mean, they would be responsible for it. What happened, I think they also realized that she could die in the jail. In the jail. And then before that, during some time, he knew Burari. I don't know if you know Burari. He was a great friend of Loya and all that. But he joined the Congress. So he came to us and said, if all she has to do is apologize to Indira Gandhi, if she says she's sorry and she, all this is a big mistake, you know, if she let her go. My mother was so, she said, no way. They said, what have I done? I only believe in good things, what is this, what did she refuse to do all that? Before you came, you have to tell something. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, I must have made this up when I was 16 uh, years ago. <laughs> and it's called Sneha. And I think it's Part of it I maybe mean, developed slowly through the years. But the basic thing was what I did when I was 16. brother had left and uh, he had left a tape behind and uh, he, with his music and there was one particular song uh, was I wish I was uh, you know Jesus Christ and I could change the world uh, that kind of song it was a very, very beautiful piece that he had written himself and she would listen to that again and again and again and again repeatedly and we would get very irritated and say why are you listening to this all the time you know you're going to see him, he's going to come back. 
And she would say, no, I don't think so. And she couldn't bear the thought that she was not able to see him. I think both of them had uh, some feeling that they would not see each other again. I just remember it as a period of immense love yeah, towards her and compassion. Yeah. You know, whatever she wanted to eat or do, it's like whatever her wishes were, whether ice cream at Lakeview or to see a film or all those kinds of things. And uh, yeah, so we were just making it happen for her, that's all. I also went and met CGK and, and, and uh, George in jail, in uh, Tihar jail. They picked me up in Delhi as well for questioning after I went to Tihar. Uh, because then they, I think, made some connections. So I was taken for questioning there for a whole day. But they never actually arrested me. They, they always let me go. I was leaving Delhi by train. I had called her in the morning on Murahari's phone. Um, so long distance calls was not a problem because, uh, you know, he had the government of India paying for it. And so I called her and uh, we talked to her. And then she said, are you leaving today? And I said, yes. And uh, she said, uh, so when will you come back? So I said, tomorrow. And she said, oh, but that'll be too late. And I was wondering why, you know, because tomorrow, you know. He drove into the house. There were these hundreds of cars and people. And you know, I couldn't even enter that little lane, the St. Mark's Road lane. And then, of course, I knew that, you know, my father came out to greet me and took me in. And uh, she was lying there and he kept saying, look how beautiful she is. You know, she really looked peaceful. So, in a sense, she actually... Uh, signed her own release paper. She did. And I think it was just a couple of days before the parole was due to expire. She decided not to go back, I think. I remember her death and her funeral, you know. Uh, it was like a public meeting, her funeral. It, the, the, the number of people who turned up, you know. Um, and you'd think, you know, emergency still hadn't been lifted. And they came. And uh, everybody was there, the IB was there, the police were definitely there. But they came. And I think partly it was the personal, uh, you know, the warmth, the, the kind of thing she had for people. But also there was a feeling that she stood for something, you know, and, and had paid that price. Um, hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of people. I, I, I can't, I mean, there was no counting, you know. And uh, I think people also, it was a way, you know, in that very intense repression that you felt you could be out there physically in public. You know, what would they do? What could they do? We took her to this, uh... Electri electric crematorium. First time that sound of that, you know, clanging shut. I mean, that seemed final, you okay. know. It was that final thing and we're not going to see her and she's not going to see another sunrise thing, mm -hmm. you know. That was something else. Mm -hmm. dark night of the soul and it's always three o'clock in the morning and you say then that three o'clock is important to you then yeah it's strange because I I do wake up with this when I have this uh, uh, this kind of uh, dream of her calling me 
and I wake up, it's always three o'clock in the morning. I don't know psychological law, what, but it's. That's the moment in which the connection takes place. place. Thank you.